Hi everybody and welcome to my YouTube series on anatomy and physiology. This video is meant to be an overview video. What that means is that it is a composite of all the shorter videos I did on this subject. I did this so that students could watch the full content in one sitting rather than just watching several different videos in a row. If there is a specific topic that you would like to revisit, you can either go to that specific chapter in this video or simply go to the separate shorter video I did on that subject. The links for those shorter videos that are included in this one can be found below. Let's begin. Erythrocytes, the most abundant cells in our blood, are true lifesavers. These remarkable cells carry out the crucial task of transporting oxygen to all parts of our body, ensuring the proper functioning of our organs and tissues. Let's take a closer look at the structure of erythrocytes. Red blood cells have a unique biconcave shape, which provides them with a larger surface area for efficient gas exchange. I like to think of them as looking a little bit like donut shapes, but instead of a hole in the middle, they have a thin membrane. Erythrocytes lack a nucleus, which allows more room to accommodate an oxygen-carrying molecule called hemoglobin. They do not use aerobic respiration for energy, Therefore, they don't consume any of the energy that they're carrying. At the core of the erythrocyte's oxygen-carrying ability lies hemoglobin, a protein molecule responsible for binding and transporting oxygen. When erythrocytes pass through the lungs, they pick up oxygen and bind it to hemoglobin. As they circulate throughout the body, they release this oxygen to tissues and organs in need. In this way, I kind of like to think of erythrocytes as being like a food delivery service, like our body's own version of Uber Eats or DoorDash. It picks up oxygen from the lungs in the same way a delivery driver would pick up food at a restaurant. It then takes it to where it is needed. The hemoglobin is sort of like the insulated bag the delivery person would put the food inside to transport. The production of erythrocytes takes place in the bone marrow and is known as erythropoiesis. Stem cells in the bone marrow differentiate into erythroblasts, which mature into erythrocytes. This process is regulated by a hormone called erythropoietin, which is produced by the kidneys in response to low oxygen levels in the blood. Erythrocytes, while vital, have a limited lifespan of only about 120 days. Once they age or become damaged, they are removed from the circulation and broken down with their components being recycled for future use. This process is done by specific white blood cells or leukocytes, which are known as macrophages. These macrophages are produced in the spleen and liver. There are several erythrocyte related conditions that can significantly impact our health. Anemia occurs when there's a decrease in the number of red blood cells or insufficient hemoglobin. Symptoms of anemia can be quite extensive, but generally includes feelings of being tired, weak, having shortness of breath. When extreme, it can actually lead to loss of consciousness and cognitive problems among more severe symptoms. Because there are too few erythrocytes and or hemoglobin, Cells throughout your body aren't getting the oxygen that they need to thrive. So this is what causes those symptoms. On the other hand, we have polycythemia, which is characterized by an excess of red blood cells, leading to thicker blood and potential circulation issues. Polycythemia can happen naturally, but can also be done artificially. In fact, in many professional sports, there have been issues with some athletes engaging in what is called blood doping where they increase the amount of erythrocytes in their blood to gain an advantage. Just think about it. If anemia causes you to be tired and weak, the opposite will make you have more energy and feel stronger. Of course, this is hugely dangerous and can cause extensive damage to a person's health. Leukocytes, also known as white blood cells, are the guardians of our immune system. These incredible cells form a vital part of our body's defense against infections and harmful invaders. There are several types of leukocytes, each with specialized functions. Neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes work together to detect, attack, 
and destroy pathogens, keeping us healthy and free from infections. Never let monkeys eat bananas is a mnemonic device to remember the order of leukocytes from most numerous to least numerous. Neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils. So neutrophils are the most numerous, followed by lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and finally basophils. Leukocytes are an integral part of our body's defense mechanism against infections. Neutrophils are first responders, rapidly migrating to sites of infection and engulfing harmful bacteria through phagocytosis. You can think of phagocytosis as the destruction or ingestion of bacteria. Eosinophils target parasites and modulate allergic reactions, while basophils play a role in inflammation and allergy reactions. Lymphocytes, a type of leukocyte, hold the key to our immune system's memory and coordination. There are different types of lymphocytes, and we will talk about them again later when we cover the immune system. But for right now, it's important to know the basics between two of these types, B cells and T cells. B cells produce antibodies that recognize and neutralize specific pathogens, while T cells orchestrate immune responses either by directly attacking infected cells or by coordinating the overall immune defense. Platelets, on the other hand, are the unsung heroes responsible for the remarkable process of hemostasis, or blood clotting. Platelets, also known as thrombocytes, are crucial for maintaining the integrity of our circulatory system. When a blood vessel is injured, platelets rush to the scene and stick to the damaged vessel walls. They then release chemical signals that recruit more platelets, forming a platelet plug that stops bleeding and begins the process of clot formation. When activated, platelets trigger a cascade of clotting factors leading to the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. This forms a stable fibrin mesh that reinforces the platelet plug, stopping excessive bleeding. Hemostasis is the body's natural mechanism to stop bleeding when blood vessels are damaged. It involves a series of coordinated steps that work together to prevent excessive blood loss while promoting healing. Hemostasis consists of three main stages, vascular spasm, platelet plug formation, and finally coagulation. Let's start with vascular spasm. When a blood vessel is injured, it undergoes vasoconstriction, narrowing its diameter to reduce blood flow. This initial response helps minimize bleeding and allows time for the next stages to occur. Next, platelets, which are also known as thrombocytes, rush to the site of injury and adhere to the damaged vessel wall. They release chemical signals that attract more platelets, creating a platelet plug that further seals the wound. This is an example of positive feedback. A positive feedback is where your body does something that leads to an increase in that action, sort of like a snowball effect. So in this case, the platelets responding to the site of an injury lead to more platelets going to that area and sending more signals for even more platelets to respond. The final stage involves coagulation, where a complex cascade of clotting factors forms a fibrin meshwork around the platelet plug, resulting in a stable blood clot. This process reinforces the plug and prevents further blood loss. Coagulation relies on an intricate network of clotting factors, including fibrinogen, prothrombin, and various enzymes. These factors interact in a well-coordinated sequence to convert inactive proenzymes into active enzymes, leading to the formation of fibrin, the key component of the blood clot. To prevent excessive clotting, our body also produces anticoagulants. These substances help control clot formation by inactivating clotting factors and promoting clot dissolution. Plasmin, an enzyme, plays a vital role in breaking down fibrin and dissolving clots when they are no longer needed. Disruptions in hemostasis can lead to various disorders. For instance, hemophilia is a genetic disorder where individuals lack specific clotting factors, leading to prolonged bleeding. 
On the other hand, thrombosis occurs when clots form excessively, potentially blocking blood flow and causing serious complications. Blood typing is a critical component of understanding the compatibility between different individuals' blood. It helps ensure safe blood transfusions, plays a crucial role in organ transplantation, and is essential during pregnancy to prevent certain complications. The ABO blood group system is one of the most well-known blood typing systems, and it categorizes blood into four main groups, A, B, AB, and O. These blood groups are determined by the presence or absence of specific antigens on the surface of red blood cells. Antigens are substances that can trigger an immune response. In the ABO blood group system, there are two main antigens, A and B antigens. Individuals with type A blood have A antigens on their red blood cells, while those with type B blood have type B antigens. If both A and B antigens are present, it results in type AB blood. However, individuals with type O blood lack both A and B antigens. In addition to antigens, our blood contains antibodies, which are proteins that recognize and attack foreign substances in the body. For example, individuals with type A blood have anti-B antibodies and will create a reaction if exposed to B antigens. While those with type B blood have anti-A antibodies and will have a reaction if exposed to A antigens. Type AB individuals have neither anti-A nor anti-B antibodies, so there is no reaction if either are present, whereas type O individuals have both anti-A and anti-B antibodies. Besides the ABO system, there's another crucial blood group system known as the RH system. The RH system classifies blood as RH positive if the RH antigen is present on the red blood cells and RH negative if the antigen is absent. Blood typing is essential during blood transfusions to ensure compatibility between the donor's blood and the recipient's blood. For example, individuals with type A blood can safely receive blood from type A or type O donors. Similarly, those with type B blood can receive blood from type B or type O donors. Type AB individuals are universal recipients and can receive blood from any blood group because they have both antigens present already, while type O individuals are universal donors but can only receive blood from type O donors because they have neither A nor B antigens present. Don't forget, we also have the RH system to consider too when talking about blood transfusions. So just to complicate things a little more, an RH negative person cannot receive blood from anyone that is RH positive, even if they are also the same blood type. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and share it with others. To keep informed about new videos being created, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell. If you have any questions or topics you'd like for us to cover, feel free to reach out and let us know. Thanks for joining today and see you in the next video.